Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Speak With Presence podcast. I'm Jen Valenga. And I'm Jennifer Retley thomas and we are the co-host of the Speak With Presence podcast, as well as co-founders of Voice First World. Yes, and the Speak With Presence podcast is where perfection is overrated, leaders listen, and we all speak up to influence change. JRT, I'm going to ask you who you're interviewing today, and I'm also going to say my Wi-Fi is being funny, so you might have to take it on. But who are we interviewing today? There's a lot of pressure going on here, girlfriend. There's a lot. Oh, gosh. All right. Well, today we are interviewing Dr. <clears throat> Dalma Novak. She is an engineer. She is the VP of Engineering at Octane Wireless. And we would like to note that she is the third woman we have interviewed on this podcast who is a member of I. Triple E. That's right. And I won't even tell you what I triple E stands for because every time you try to ask that, everyone says the name, what it is and what it represents is not indicative of its, uh, the words that stand for the initials stand for those words anymore. But we'll just say it's the major engineering association with many societies. It's a gigantic organization. So maybe Dalma will talk to us a little bit more about that. But IEEE is huge. And yeah, we've interviewed two other people from IEEE before that, that are professionals in the engineering field. All right, Jen. I think we should get this program started. Okay, so I I do want to share, though, because we're sort of we're moving. It was International Women's Day last week, and we are in the theme of interviewing international women. I did want to say that Dr. Dalma Novak was born in Croatia, emigrated to Hungary with her family, and then got her degrees in Australia and is living in the United States. So truly a global representative. So before we bring her on, we like to share a message from somebody she knows. Here we go. Dalma Novak is a woman with a truly extraordinary background and set of skills. I have worked with her for several years on IEEE committees and boards. And for those who are not familiar with IEEE, It is the largest technical professional organization in the world with more than 420,000 members. Dalma brings so many valuable attributes, not only to her work with IEEE, but to everything in which she is engaged. She is a global citizen, having lived in Europe and worked and lived in both Australia and the United States. She also is familiar with not only academe, having worked as a university professor, research, and administrator, but also with the corporate world as both an entrepreneur and co-founder of a successful company and as a key executive in a multifaceted company. She is very adept working with people from many cultural backgrounds, and in her role as the chair of the IEEE Technical Activities Board Committee on Diversity and Inclusion, she has made significant contributions in helping the 47 societies and councils of IEEE implement meaningful and effective initiatives in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. She has a great sense of humor, is extremely skilled at consensus building, and is an incredibly thoughtful, collegial, innovative, collaborative, and responsive person. I'm lucky to have her as one of my wonderful friends. She is a true warrior woman. Oh, a warrior woman. That's from Ruth Dyer. And she explained IEEE much better than I could. <laughs> Let's bring on Dalma Novak. Hello, Dalma. It's so good to see you here. Hello, Jen. Hi, JRT. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Absolutely. Well, it's going to be a fun 30 minutes. Yes, it is. So we want to dive right in and ask you, well, we want to ask you about a time that you felt like a powerful speaker. But before we do that, is there anything else that we maybe didn't cover that you want to share about your position right now in your career that maybe we didn't cover in the opening? No, I think I think you mentioned everything. So I, I was a professor and then I went to the dark side. Uh, working in industry and then starting uh, helping to start my own, my own company. So I'm still I still have one foot in the 
in the uh, academe role because I'm a professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne. So I still wear a little teeny tiny academic hat as well. Can't ever get away from it. Can't get away. <laughs> you can't. Once you're in, well, could you share a time with us that you felt like a powerful communicator and speaker? Maybe what are some of the actions that you took to help you feel that way? I know you've, you've spoken on many large and small stages, virtually and in person. When have you felt like a powerful speaker? Uh, I think when I get, when um, I first got some feedback that, uh, what, what I was saying was, was working effectively in terms of how I was communicating. And when I look back on uh, how I learned to communicate effectively, it has very much evolved over time. Starting off as a professor, the first thing that you need to do is to present um, effectively giving your research presentation, for example. So the first part was... Um, giving a technical presentation, but being able to do it in such a way that everybody clearly understood what you were doing, the results that, that you got, and you were able to uh, answer questions effectively as well. And then it moved to working in industry, then the environment was quite different. Now you're involved in uh, running, a, running a team, you need to manage your, uh, your team effectively communicate to them what the goals of the, the team are in the company and then also present the work of your team to other areas with, within the company. And again, my communication style evolved. What I re realized what's important, the most important thing is to, is to listen and to be able to uh, communicate the message in such a way that everyone understands what you're doing you're listening to the feedback from everybody as well and you're internalizing that and responding to that too. Um, and then the third part of how I communicate is, you know, you talked about the IEEE. I mean, it's a, it's a huge organization and there are, you know, thousands and thousands of volunteers and we work on different uh, initiatives. We work on committees. So on a committee, you're again now involved with, uh, interacting and getting your point of view across to another volunteer in order to to get the committee to to work effectively. So all of those different parts, and I think that I've learned to cultivate confidence. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how I was able to do that successfully, but clearly I have based on the feedback that I get. I'm more, I'm told that I. I, I speak confidently and, and calmly, whether I necessarily feel that internally or not. But clearly, I've been able to, to get that across to people. Uh, I think what's important is listening and being able to convey your message in a concise and clear way. And I think, you know, some people find that, that challenging. But I think the more you focus on being able to present your message clearly uh, and show empathy in the message that you're conveying as well, and highlighting that you're listening to the views of everybody else and internalizing them and recognizing them, that's when you can be, be effective as a, as a communicator. So certainly the feedback that I received has helped me evolve in terms of my presentation style, my communication style, and how effective that I've been. Yeah, feedback and, and gr is so important for growth. And you mentioned before we went live about the differences between being concise in the academic realm and being concise in industry. Could you share a little bit about that? So I, you know, working in, uh, in an academic environment and being in department meetings, and I know, you know if there are professors out there who are listening to this, they know the same thing. And you have these, these department meetings that can go on for hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very different uh, approach you know there is a, there seems to be sort of no time limit to someone being able to express their point of view even they've if they've made the same point perhaps 10 10 different ways but there's the same point all fundamentally and uh going into industry it was about you have a limited time you have a you have a deadline for your meeting you have an agenda you need to get through it and uh, the meetings were run much more efficiently with the mindset of 
we need to make progress here and move on and people need to do other things. And uh, mm -hmm. for me, a, a short meeting is always a, is a good meeting because, you know, at, at some point, if everyone's made their point, but everyone's just repeating what they're saying, then you're not, <laughs> you're not achieving what you're trying to do. And then you're just not being able to accomplish the other, all the other things that you, you need to do. Are there any ways to redirect those conversations? The, the role of the chair is critical in doing that. They, ha they have to really be paying attention to what's being said, recognize when the same comment is being said. And, you know, it's the role of the chair to say, we've already had, heard that comment, you know, only express an opinion if it's different to what somebody else said, because otherwise we don't need to, hear the same opinion over and over again. We can just say, okay, we've got consensus from half the room. Let's listen to the opinions of the other half who, who don't agree for whatever reason. But sometimes it's, it's human nature. You know, people do like to hear themselves speak <laughs> and like to be able to sometimes uh, in a public forum show that they are agreeing with a particular you know, the comment, which I understand as well. And I see that in, in IEEE, you know, meetings sometimes. But uh, you can still say, I agree, and then, you know, move on and don't have to, to repeat everything over and over again. But how, how does that play out in a, through a gender lens? Well, oh, you mean in terms of people having, having an agenda or... Just yeah. do maybe the question is, do you see it show up in a gendered way in terms of who's heard and who isn't and who needs to repeat and who doesn't, or is it equal? I'm yeah, yeah. Really I mean you you definitely do see that. And <laughs> I I see that more often that um uh men seem to want to convey their opinion more frequently, more loudly. It was interesting from a cultural background coming from Australia to the US, even though English is the, the main language in both places. In Australia, the culture that I was brought up with was that if you were in a meeting, uh, you only spoke if you absolutely knew that what you were about to say was 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. that you, that, and that's when you, when you spoke up at a meeting, then when you knew that for sure. And then coming to the US and being in a in a company, sitting around a table and listening to people who were conveying information that actually they they didn't know for sure, but it was just something that they wanted to get out there. And that's when I really understood, okay, so I don't necessarily have to know something um, that is a hundred percent true. I could just could just speculate. But it's something that I'm very sensitive to because I can be in a meeting and I can hear somebody saying something that uh, clearly is speculative. And for me, if you don't necessarily know for sure, and perhaps this is a, you know, perhaps women are more um, focused on this, that, you know, they're, they want to be hundred percent sure before they, before they say something or they want to make a comment about something. Whereas I think, men have more of a tendency to just sort of get it out there, even if, if they're wrong, if they're not necessarily sure. And, you know, coming from an engineering background, it's all about accuracy and, and facts and being sure about the, sure about the facts. So that was a, that was a different cultural change. And the other thing I noticed here too, is sometimes it's sort of the, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the most, the most oil. So about, who is the most vocal in the room? And again, that goes back to the chair because the chair has to recognize who is clearly perhaps dominating the conversation. Um, I think that happens a lot, that conversations are dominated and you, as a chair, you need to control that very well to make sure that there are other people in the room who want to speak, have an opportunity to convey their opinions, not just the loudest ones. Yeah, good chairs are disciplined for sure. Absolutely. Well, Dalma, I, I'm sorry. I don't know if you could see me during this, but I just had the giggles. And the only reason I had the giggles during what you were saying was not of disrespect, 
But bringing back some memories, because I am privileged to be on this podcast today with two esteemed faculty members in their field. I am not. I was on the development side. But the number of times when I went from industry back into higher education and development that I would sit around the table with my development hat on for two hours talking about strategy. And it was just talking about one word for 15 minutes, if that was the right word. I remember the dean, the dean that I worked for at that time, looking at me saying, Jenny, I can see that you're struggling right now. And she meant this with all goodwill, knowing I was not the academic, because I think I was sliding down into my chair because I just was eager to execute. I was eager to execute. And so I just, I appreciate the dialogue and I appreciate everyone's sharing, but it is key to the person, the chair, the dean, to whomever running the meeting to keep things on track. Because I think I heard the same thing several times over a two hour time frame, And I was dying as a, <laughs> I mean, I was dying. You could resuscitate me on the floor at any moment. And Jen has witnessed this and I do not have a poker face. So with all I, that, I thank know. you. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. You yeah. get to the point where it's like, we're not learning anything new no. here. Let's move on, shall we? Let's move on. Right. You know, the the joke about podcasting, too, I've, I've had to be very aware of this lately because I do the editing. The, there's a joke about podcasters that they bring on guests and the guest says something amazing like you just did. And then they repeat exactly what the guest said. It was like, why do you need to? But to your earlier point is it's about some people are wired that way, but also it's a point of connection, a way to say, I've heard you, I understand you, but mm -hmm. to re to paraphrase what the person already said, that's why it's great to have podcasts on hyperspeed. You could do like three times speed and get through all the stuff that the hosts <laughs> have repeated that the guest already said, hopefully we're not doing that today. No, no. Please. I just wanted Dalma to know while I had the chuckles and I was waiting for these tears to come down my face at any moment because it was just <laughs> proud memories I have from my past. So in uh, technical meetings, and again, this is a consequence of getting older and, and, and cultivating confidence is that I have got to the point where if someone does repeat something that I just said, I'll say, well, thank you for mansplaining. Or, and I'll actually, I'll call people out now. I didn't have the confidence when I was younger, but now I do. And I say, well, thank you for just repeating what I said. I'm glad you appreciate my, my point of view. Because you have to highlight things for people. Otherwise, they'll just, you know, they don't see what they're doing. I, and I don't think there's, most of the time, there's no malice involved there. And they're probably thinking that they're, um, you know, perhaps giving you some, um, you know, kudos by, by expressing this, the same opinion. But you have to be careful about how that's perceived by other people around the room. If other people may just see it as, oh, that person had the, had the good idea, you know, not that that person said it originally. Yeah. But Delma, don't you think you just said something and it should have been common sense to me 20 years ago. So early on in my career, well, not throughout my career. OK, that situation, you'd say something, then another human would repeat the same thing. And I found it at many times and I, there were times I would go to Jen and I would say, OK, this happened. Am I not because she was an expert in communicate? Am I not stating this clearly? But mm -hmm. what it came around to was what you just said, was it wasn't as much as me not being clear. I mean, there could have been times I wasn't clear, but it was, it was the mansplaining piece of it that I didn't understand early on, but it, man, did it really affect my confidence and my ability to think that I was communicating clearly? Oh, I, I, mean, I agree. Oh, you just sometimes think there's something wrong with you. Well, sometimes there is something wrong with me, but I mean, it's, it is, it is a real thing. Okay. So next question for you. So you said, I'm at the point I can, I'm, I've been told I speak confidently and clearly you are in a very technical area where it's very important to be able to take things that most people don't understand and put it into a very clear and understandable way, depending upon who your audience is. So my question to you is, what advice would you give to the younger you or to that younger generation 
to think of everything you you've learned the process, what would you say to somebody to maybe help them learn a little faster, even though sometimes time, it just does take time. <laughs> it, does, yeah, it does take time. So I think that when you're armed with information and you do all the research that you need to do in order to express your opinion, that can give you an inherent confidence because you you can you can say um, that you're you're referring to things that you have read about or that you know for sure, and I think that's a natural way to boost your confidence automatically because if someone questions what you're saying, you've got the background behind it, the research that you've done on a particular topic to be able to defend what it is that you're saying. And I guess what I, that was something that I learned over time, that um, speaking is actually, and speaking effectively and communicating effectively is a lot about doing your background work before you go into a meeting or you're giving a, te a technical presentation so that you, you're sort of making it look effortless, but you've actually done a lot of the sort of the background work behind it. And that would be something that I would like to tell myself. You can sort of start to build your confidence by at least having, having that part, that, that part behind you to feel that you can, you have the ability to respond um, when you have, when you ask questions or perhaps when somebody confronts you about what you're, your opinion or, or something like that. So I, I think that's something that I, I've learned over time. And um, uh, I think that's a, that's a good way to start cu cultivating your, your confidence because the, the confidence piece is very important. And I think that um, other than just taking time and being more experienced, it, it, it does, you know, there are only a certain number of things that you can do to, to make that, make that perhaps accelerate. You know. You're speaking to preparation and practice, and I'm curious, is the amount of time, okay, so exper experience is part of it, but the amount of time that it takes to prepare for a technical talk, do you think younger professionals overestimate or underestimate or know how much time it takes to prep? Oh, that's a good, it's an interesting question. I've not actually thought about that. Um, so uh, I would say perhaps they, un they underestimate because I think that really being able to give a good technical presentation is not just about you being able to present sort of the contents of your work, you know, showing the experiment that you did and the results, but it's really being able to think about what is the story that you want to convey about how you went about this process? And when you convey a story and you explain and you introduce, why did I do this? What was I trying to uh, investigate? What outcome was I trying to achieve? By telling a story, it makes people understand your message so much more effectively. And that storytelling piece is only something that I learned was required of, of me when I, start, when I gave these technical presentations, you know, when I first started, um, I did my PhD and then I'd give this presentation, I would just sort of point and talk to what was on the slide. And then I realized I need to actually speak as, as you write a journal paper, for example, when you're introducing the topic, you're explaining the motivation for what you did, you're explaining how you did it and the outcome. That's when really people understand what you did and why you did it. And, and the, the message that you convey is, is so much more effective. And I think that applies whether you're giving a technical presentation or you're having a team meeting or you're on, you're on a committee. It's that story storytelling piece. But again, being doing it in a concise way and making the mes message clear about each of those parts, about why you did something and where you're trying to, to get to the next step. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's the narrative, JRT, what? <laughs> I was just going to ask Dalma. I know she's got a very important role, but if you'd like to come work for us on the marketing sales side, that would be great because you just said exactly <laughs> what we help people do. So. Storytelling. Well, you for hire. Yes. We'll take you. I didn't, say it. I didn't say it as well as you did. I should have said the narrative. That's, that, that summarizes it in a nutshell right there. 
but you're the technical person and I am the storytelling artistic <laughs> narrative person. And I spend my whole life now helping people understand how, how much time it takes to also take a story and prep it and weave it in to make a point about whatever the topic is or the technical piece. It's, it's some people, it's very hard to convince that story is important. So I'm very happy that someone like you, who is an expert in your field, who understands the technical so well, even you said it's about story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was a, that was amazing. All of this was great, but honestly, I just want people to know we did not pay you to say that. We did not pay <laughs> you to say it that well. That was all authentic in the moment. <laughs> okay. Well, Jen, do you want to, I know we are close to time. Do you want to ask the last question? Oh, I do. Okay. So <laughs> we have started asking just for a little humor and to have a fun clip on all the socials, but don't feel any pressure. We have been asking this question. We are voice first world. We've been asking what on earth, which is a moment of unbelievable moments, maybe of bias, but it's something you've witnessed in your world or personally that made you just go, what on earth in the working space? Do you have a story like that? Uh, yes, I do. Oh, I can't right. wait. That's it. Let's go. <laughs> when I went to my very first uh, job interview, just after I finished my PhD, I was in, in Australia at the University of Queensland, and I went for a position as a tenured academic in the department, and there were all these professors sitting around the, the table interviewing me. And, you know, the, it was a good conversation. The interview went well. They also had the advantage that they knew me because they had, you know, a number of them had taught me over, over the years. So, you know, I felt confident going out of that, that meeting. And then uh, I found out later that, uh, well, actually during the, during the interview, one of the professors asked me, so what is your husband going to do when he finishes his PhD? Because he was also finishing his PhD in the same department. So, I was just taken aback. I couldn't believe that they were actually asking that question. You know, the assumption was as soon as he finished his PhD and got a job somewhere, uh, then I would be going with him, you know, so I, I would be out of there. And so clearly they had a concern that I was not going to stay. And so I, I told my husband this when I finished, uh, left the interview, and, but I thought I, can, I convinced them um, that, no, he was going to stay. And he had this particular job offer on coming up so it would be all fine and everything. I thought they were convinced, but apparently not because then the next day they uh, saw him in the, I think it was the head of department, saw him in the in the hallway and actually asked him then directly what he was going to do after his PhD, just to sort of validate, you know, the, the thing that I said during the interview and to see if we were being consistent. And so, of course, you know, he, he said the same thing that I did so he, he corroborated my my testimony. So that was good. <laughs> and then the whole irony of this was that in the end, I actually ended up leaving leaving the department and he followed me to, I took a job at the University of Melbourne and then he followed me. So uh, at the end of the day, it wasn't exactly how they thought it was going to turn out for them. It wasn't him leaving, it was me. So, oh, it's so my, common <laughs> it's so common and now we would go legal uh legal. exactly i know this is like 1990 1992 i think so yes there was it's no there was no hr person sitting in the interview room nothing like that it still happens though we heard something horrific last week which we sweet time Delma, not sometimes. right now. We can't no, right now. no, we're not. But I'm just going to say, story. JRT, Dalma, sometimes we hear stories offline, not recorded, that women say this can't be shared. So if we could actually share all of those things that we heard, <laughs> you can't imagine. But it, that's a good story. And it's what on earth? What on earth? That's a what on earth. What on earth? Okay, so I need clarity. I'm a slow learner here. So I just want to verify in that interview. So did you take that position and stay for a while and then leaving your husband followed? 
I did. So I took okay. the position, but I only ended up staying for eight months. Oh, good for you. I was offered this fantastic opportunity at the University of Melbourne to join a, um, a professor who had just come back from Bell Labs there. And that was sort of my my dream job to go there and, and join his lab. So, so I ended up leaving and then he followed. Well, you have had a fascinating career from the research that I've done. And while this podcast is more specifically about communication and not so much about the technicals of your career, I highly encourage anyone who's watching who wants to know more about IEEE or the technology space for engineers that you please go look up IEEE and uh, do a Google search on Dr. Dalma Novak because I found some really good interviews. She is a powerhouse and we are so glad that you decided to join us on the Speak With Presence podcast for sure. Thank you both. Thank you both very much. I've really enjoyed talking to you today. Well, we are thrilled and we will finish up. We're going to put you back in the green room and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay. JR. Wow. 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 I mean, the women that we have interviewed from IEEE, I mean, and I just want to do a shout out to Ruth Dyer, who has been such a great supporter of our work and has made so many of these recommendations for these interviews. And, you know, I think the one thing that we have learned is, is yes, you know, 420,000 members in this association. And I can only imagine from what little we know about the women is that it's been an amazing community and it is amazing community, whether you're men, uh, male or female um, in this space. And so if you are in this space, I would encourage people to learn more. Um, about what they do and and to get further engaged. So many different societies. And I keep thinking back to Kathy Land and what she said when we interviewed her. I can't remember what episode number she is, but Kathy Land might have been the first. Also yeah. a rec recommendation from Ruth Dyer, who's been an amazing supporter of ours from the beginning. But Kathy said that she felt that there was less bias in the engineering fields because it's always about the creative project, getting to the solution and the best idea wins. And I like to think that that's true. So, but as you heard, bias is everywhere and has been everywhere. And we'll continue to uncover it as we move through the Speak With Presence podcast. JRT, anything to share about the upcoming? What do you got on your list? You got anything to check off your list? No, I just, well, I say no, but yes, I do. We are releasing our next podcast next Tuesday. Oh, yeah. And we interviewed President Casey Shrum, who is the president of Oklahoma State University. And her background is as a physician, a pediatrician, transitioned into the dean of the medical school and is now the president of the university, uh, full of wisdom and amazing stories and storytelling. And we hope everybody will tune in when we release that episode. Yep. We traveled to her office. That was a really fun time and can't wait for that one. All right, JRT, this has been another episode of the Speak With Presence podcast. I will see you soon and we'll be back, friends. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.